Good afternoon. My name is Stefano Giorgetti. I am 16 years old and I come from Brazil. However, now I live in Italy and I'm a student of the American School of Milan. It is an honor to attend this event and introduce the topic, new forms of food experience. Many see food as just a substance, something necessary to live. But food is more than that. Food is an experience. We, the consumers, experience the food through our lips before, uh, we experience the food through our imagination before it tempts our lips. This experience can help us integrate new food sources to improve our diet and will potentially help millions of people into having a healthier life. New forms of food experience is not only relevant for nutrition, but also for each country's economy. It is important that uh, it is important that we focus on food innovation in order to incentivize our future generations, the millennials and Generation Z, in spending money into food, because it represents a big share of various countries' economies. It is estimated that they will spend roughly 30 million, 30 trillion dollars in assets, taking into consideration they already spend 98 billion dollars a year on food. I am looking forward to what the experts have to say on this topic. Thank you. Hello there, everyone. Uh, my name's Daniel Vanard, and I'm from the World Resources Institute. Now, I'd like to start my short presentation with a task for you all. I'm going to describe two dishes, and I'd like you to tell me afterwards which you think would be the most tasty. OK, so let's start. Uh, the first one, A, low-fat boiled sweet potato curry, or B, sweet and spicy coconut stew with slow-cooked sweet potato. So hands up for those who thought A sounded tastier. And how about B? Great. Now, I'm sure you won't be surprised to hear that they're exactly the same dish. But for me, that is fascinating, that just with the change of a few couple of words, I've universally made something sound tastier. Well, what's happening there? Well, research has shown that um, Research has shown that um, the, before we consume food, um, we create simulations in our minds of how that food may taste and how the experience might be. What we do is we take cues from the environment, especially language, and we use that to construct conceptualizations or simulations in our mind of how it would be. So, for example, I think this might be my old deck, but anyway, we'll go with it. Um, for example, uh, if we take, uh, if I told you uh, I was just about to serve you strawberry cheesecake, what your brain would do is you'd take the image of strawberries, their succulent, sweet, juicy, slightly acidic taste, with that of cheesecake, the mild, sweet, creamy, soft texture, and you would create in your mind the construction of what that food would taste like. But what's interesting is that our brains don't only use ingredients to help us create these simulations. What we also do is take concepts and use those concepts to also frame how we perceive food. So for example, there's been some fascinating research about how when we hear messaging around health, how that changes our perceptions of how we see that food. So for example, a brilliant experiment a couple of years ago where two groups of consumers um, were both given a glass of mango lassi. The mango lassi was exactly the same, but with one group, the mango lassi was described in a healthy way, and in another group, it was described in an unhealthy way. And those consumers who were given the one that was described in a healthy way reported back that they thought it was about half as tasty. A similar experiment done with cookies, where co two groups of consumers were given exactly the same cookie, um, and asked, uh, but one was health, described healthy, and the other was unhealthy. And the consumers, uh, after eating them, actually said that the one that was described healthy was about half as filling. But this language doesn't only change our psychological response. Some really interesting research as well a couple of years ago looked into the physiological response of what this language does to how we simulate food. Uh, an experiment was done where two groups of consumers, again, were given the same milkshake. But this time, one milkshake was described as a sensi shake, 
with 104 calories. And the other was an Indulgy shake with 620. And after the consumers drank the milkshakes, those who were given the healthy one were found to have three times higher level of ghrelin, which is the hunger hormone. So actually, they were hungrier after eating the one just that was described as healthy. So we know that healthy language can influence what we um, uh, perceive of food, but other language too can as well. So for example, there was some really interesting research that we did in partnership with the London School of Economics last year, where we took a menu which contained eight dishes. Two of them were plant-based dishes. Um, so as you can see here, one at the top, ris risotto primavera, and at the bottom, ricotta and, ricotta and spinach ravioli. And we gave that menu to 2,000 consumers, and we asked them to choose what they preferred. We then gave the same dish, uh, we gave the same menu to another group of consumers. And having done so, we found that those consumers who were given the one described um, as vegetarian were less likely to order it than the ones who weren't. But language can not only suppress, it can also enhance as well. So this was some other research that came out from Stanford University a couple of months ago, where they took a series of side dishes and they changed the names in their canteens to either use basic language, indulgent language, or healthy language. And what they found was that when they used healthy language, a bit like the insights I just shared with you, that suppressed sales, but actually when they use indulgent language, it actually increased sales. So I think what we're learning is that different language can begin to have a key bearing on how we perceive, but then fundamentally, what foods we choose. Now, this is all very interesting, but well, why is it important? Why do we care what, people, uh, what food people choose? Well, clearly, there are health implications, but my organization is a leading environmental and sustainability organization, and we're particularly interested in how, what food people choose because we've learned that, as I'm sure many of you know, different foods have different environmental impact. So, for example, uh, this is the greenhouse gas emissions associated with different types of food per gram of protein. And as you can see on the right, beef and lamb has a very high impact, where on the, on the left-hand side, or your right, uh, plant-based food has a lot lower impact. So we know that actually shifting consumers towards eating more plant-based food and less uh, beef especially, and meat could be a, a key win for the environment. And actually, as we've modeled it out, if we actually were able to get consumers to reduce the animal protein consumption by half, it would actually have a big contribution to reducing uh, the greenhouse gas emissions and land required for plants. This is the modeling that we did that just showed that actually it would almost halve the diet-related greenhouse gas emissions and land. Now, there's a number of um, uh, different interventions that we need to make to actually bring this change in the food system. Uh, and to shift people towards eating such food. But at the World Resources Institute, we think that changing the language and framing could be one such area that could really help drive this. So we've launched a program called the Better Buying Lab that basically brings together a range of key companies from across the food system, here we are, uh, with experts in behavior change, linguistics, marketing, communication, and advertising, to really innovate and test new approaches for how we could change the language of plant-based food and in turn drive its consumption. So we have a hypothesis um, that changing this area could actually drive a key shift in consumption habits. And so what we've been doing over the last 18 months since we launched this work was working with the 10 businesses uh, that we have running a series of creative events with them, changing the language of their plant-based food, and then doing online trials, and then also field trials to see actually what happens. Now, we're just in the process of completing that, but I, so I can't give you the specific results. But just to say what we're learning is that actually through changing the consumption, changing the framing and language of plant-based food to move it away from certain sets of language like healthy and vegetarian and meat-free, to more indulgent, exciting names with provenance that elicit emotion. We're consistently finding, both in our online trials and our field trials, that we're able to increase consumption of plant-based food by about 15 to 70%. And so I suppose, just to close, is that 
I think the conversation around the experience of food is incredibly important. And as you can tell from our work, we think that the language and framing of plant-based food could really help drive a shift in consumption towards plant-based food. And my ambition and my vision is that when we hear our favorite plant-based foods dishes described, it elicits, elicits the sense of taste and excitement and deliciousness that we had when I described the strawberry cheesecake. Many thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is going to be a really fun session because I think all of us are going to deal with ex food experiences in a, in a slightly different way. And it is such a buzzword and has been a buzzword um, for a while. The, the uh, future of retail session was a lot about how retail is migrating into food experiences. Um, my name is David McIntyre. I'm the former global head of food for Airbnb. And, I, and that's the way I'm going to approach this today is uh, to talk about uh, Silicon Valley, the tech sector globally, um, food experiences, and culinary tourism, and where those intersect. Um, so um, I think what a lot of people's first question is when you talk about culinary tourism is, is how do you get to define it? Um, and that's a really complicated thing to do because when everybody's traveling, they do eat, whether they care about food or not. Um, so there's um, some working definitions that are basically, you know, do, um, did you decide where to go based on food? Um, that I think is a really effective way to talk about this. Um, the global marketplace for uh, tourism is about $8 trillion. Um, and the best estimates are that almost half of that um, is, would fall under the rubric of culinary tourism. So it's a big, big marketplace. Uh, which is why companies uh, are starting to look at it from that very high level. Um, so to back up, let me talk a little bit about food at Airbnb and what that might mean. Um, there's a few places where Airbnb chose to focus on food. Um, the most commonly requested function for Airbnb has been when we um, book a home, can we pre-order some uh, pantry staples to be uh, at, the, uh, at the listing for us when we arrive. Um, turns out that's really complicated when you're servicing 192 countries. Um, it's a lot of vendors to deal with, so that one's still on hold. It's not there yet. Um, fairly recently, the, the functionality of being able to book a restaurant uh, went live in a few cities, but the, the biggest piece is um, what Airbnb calls experiences, um, and it's a whole separate platform from the homes platform, um, and that's a, a big piece of what I worked on while I was there. Um, the, um, basically in the way that one could host a home on Airbnb, you could host a local experience. You could become a local tour guide in a sense. Um, and I think that's a fairly revolutionary way to think about culinary tourism and it, and it um, can be uh, really, really effective uh, if it's done well. Um, and it can also be uh, a bit of a challenge, I think. And we'll get into that a little bit, uh, we'll see. I'll see how much I get through. Um, so um, if I zoom away from Airbnb and talk about sort of the larger uh, tech approach to, uh, to culinary tourism, and, and sometimes that involves food at home too, is that um, when you're traveling, some of you are traveling right now, um, you probably have your go-to to figure out where to go. You might go to Yelp, you might go to TripAdvisor, you might go to the Fork, uh, La Fourchette, you might go to um, one of those platforms. And I think um, from, from many of those, what they've done is really just aggregate as many opinions as possible. Um, and I think the challenge that those companies are facing is, is that, um, I, I know that's true for everyone here because this is a food conference, but I think it's true for everybody, that you don't consider yourself to have average taste. Um, that you have more specific needs um, and want something that's curated in a different way. Um, and um, I would argue that Airbnb has a really smart model by leveraging locals. That's a, that's a smart way to go about that. Um, I could also envision Facebook doing the same thing. Um, and uh, they haven't, that I'm aware of. But um, if you start to look at the kinds of local, curated, trusted opinions 
that are informed by local knowledge, that starts to get very interesting. Um, a, a big piece of what I worked on um, there was what are the implications of taking something and, and opening it up so broadly. Um, we've seen these other big platforms of Uber and Amazon uh, uh, and Facebook have some real world implications to sort of really changing the way we go through these things. Um, and some of them are intended and some of them are unintended. Um, I, I, the example that I always think of is when I travel, it, nine times out of 10, there is a pod-based coffee maker in the Airbnb that I'm staying at. And I don't have anything against that, but that now means that I don't go out and try the local coffee, um, which, you know, so Airbnb had nothing to do with that as a company. That was a, an environment that it created and a vacuum that it created for people who needed an easy way for people to be able to make coffee. Um, and often when I'm talking to equipment manufacturers, I talk about this, that there's an interesting marketplace now. There's three million homes hosts, and I think as these uh, experiences ramp up, you'll see uh, even more coming online. Um, so uh, I'll wrap up. The, what I want to leave is that there is a big marketplace that we can expect others to be looking at that marketplace um, in, uh, in a way to be the gatekeeper, in a sense. Um, and uh, that's something that we ought to all consider about. If we care about local customs, if we care about authenticity, if we care about our own sort of connections and experiences with food, because um, it's not just going to a restaurant, it's going to a marketplace, it's finding that, that little hidden gem. Um, we know what some of these big companies are, are doing. We know that um, it has great benefits. We also know it has real challenges. Um, and I think it's something that we can work together on as an innovative community uh, to try to make sure that as we move towards what I think is an inevitable future, uh, of having some marketplaces and gatekeepers who are gonna allow us this amazing opportunity to find out what the food opportunities are as we travel or even at home. Um, but that also means that there's gonna be winners and losers in that. Um, and I think uh, it's a great opportunity for us to think about who might lose out on that and is that the way we wanna move forward. So I'll leave you with that. Thank you so much for your time. Hello, everybody. So it's very loud. Okay. Um, so thank you, former speaker, for mentioning us <laughs> and introducing the fork. We are operating in this um, space. We are talking about food innovation um, and new ways of food experiencing. We are a player in the market because we operate in, in booking online for, for restaurant space. How many of you have booked online a restaurant in the past month? Okay, and how many of you have used the fork? Okay, and other international players in the space, like open table, book a table? Okay, so, um, we want to add some uh, information that we got from customers and also from restaurants to see what the trends are and what they are asking and what they are doing in this space. So we departure always from customers because as you mentioned before, people enjoy traveling, enjoy living, eating, experiencing food. Uh, and technology is evolving very fast. So technology can help to, to improve the experience and to move trends towards one direction or the other. Um, restaurants have to fulfill what customers uh, expect and what they would like to have, but there is a gap. So we are operating in this uh, sector since uh, in Italy since three years and in Europe since um, 10 years. Um, let's see, okay. So asking just the four Italian customers, this is only for Italy, but we can expect other European customers to reply the same way. So yes, they would 
like that the restaurants remember some things from the last experience. So every time I go to my favorite place, if they know me because I have been there 20 times, of course they will give me my favorite table. Uh, but maybe I have been twice. With tools like the fork, they can remember also that you prefer sitting uh, in a certain place. So this is something that everybody appreciates. But when you go into more details, because here, of course, we have all the data available, um, yes, people would like to, to be uh, um, celebrated or said happy birthday if it's your birthday. Maybe not that much to know the number of times, because you know the privacy is still privacy, so I don't want to be too much uh, stalking. But yes, if I'm a celiac or if I have any uh, like lactose intolerance, it would be great if the restaurant remembers that. Um, this is something that we are working on. So people would love to use technology because that's what we are doing. We are using technology to improve the experience in the restaurant. So booking a restaurant on the phone is quite frustrating for I think everyone, you know, sometimes it's busy, um, sometimes uh, they are fully booked and you are spending time in calling them. And uh, so there's no doubt that the online booking is, is an advantage. But on top of that, there are other possibilities that, that we can um, use. Like for example, I would be, I would love to be informed if my <laughs> dream restaurant that is always fully booked Last minute they had cancellation and I can jump in. This is something I would love. Promotions, yes. Well, the fork, if you have used it, is full of uh, discounts because we are using the yield management. So it's the same concept at uh, airline companies and, and hotels. So depending on your availability, you can lower prices. So this is the same concept and people love it. Why I wouldn't go to a restaurant with 50% discount, for 30% discount, if I can save, I'm smarter. But the food experience is the same. And the fork is not Groupon, it's the opposite experience, because you can choose whatever you want from the menu, and the discount is applied directly on the cash. But restaurants, where they are in this technology evolution, how they can improve the service, in the food, uh, in the dining experience. Well, I, I was a bit surprised to see that Italy was quite bit well placed. If you look at the US and Italy are similar. So, okay, Italians do it good. Um, seems that still half of the restaurants don't dedicate much time in marketing, in promoting the service, promoting their menu, their uh, excellences is quite low, but the over 25% of the time is spent in marketing activities. Sorry, the, the, the question is in Italian, so it's, it's the time invested in marketing for the restaurant space. So the restaurants, how much time of the day they spend in marketing? Well, French, they are quite well or they think they are quite well, uh, well uh, promoted because they dedicate very little time in marketing. Um, also in UK, I expected a higher uh, volume of, of responses saying, uh, yes, we are doing marketing. Okay. Spain, Italy, Spain less than Italy, but yeah, still uh, some time to dedicate to marketing. I think it can be, can be improved. Also restaurants are special category because they can be family restaurants where they have very little time to dedicate to promotional activities or they can be changed. So they have a dedicated person that is doing marketing for them. This is what digital marketing tools they are using today. So this is coming, sorry, I had to say it before, but this is coming from a TripAdvisor survey conducted over 2000 respondents that are restaurants using uh, TripAdvisor services in these countries. So social networks are flying because everybody has the fan page, you know, everybody, um, maybe they don't use it as good as they could, but they, they know that it's important, so they are opening Facebook pages. Italy is particular because the online advertisement that is quite 
large, I mean, they have, we have many spaces to do online advertisement. For Italy, it's only search engine marketing, so it's Google. You know, I'm on Google, and that, that counts. Um, press is still quite important in France and the UK. You know, I'm a person from digital world. <laughs> I was a bit surprised to see, especially in the UK, press is very important. So, you know, advertising in the local newspapers or maybe flyers, you know, are important for restaurants. And how they feel this marketing is effective. So, in the US, there, it's obvious that digital marketing is it's effective, it works. Italy, UK too. French, they think it's not that effective. Maybe that's why they, th they don't use it as much. Okay. Well, as the fork, what do we offer to restaurants and to diners? We have a very big base of restaurants, mostly in Europe. So we are operating in 11 countries, 50,000 restaurants in total, of which 10,000 are in Italy. Um, we have 12 million the app, app downloads, um, and it's growing every day, of course. Uh, and 11 million reviews only on the fork. This doesn't include TripAdvisor. So TripAdvisor is much, much bigger. And the reviews on the fork are from diners. So we only register reviews from the people that have eaten in the restaurant. And reviews are important. And you were right when you said that not everybody has the same taste. Not everybody is expecting the same, but we can see that reviews are really determining the, the consumptions. So it really influences the bookings. It's, it's an immediate correlation between the average rating and the bookings of the restaurants. And also in the words that they use. So if I'm looking for pizza, which in Italian is quite common, you know, we have many restaurants that are not only pizzerias, but they do also pizza. You have to understand, is this a real pizzeria? So you have to read and find out if the pizza is the main strong dish, okay? So reviews are key for us. Um, for customers, it's very pleasant experience. I don't know if you have used it yet, but it's very easy to find a restaurant because it's geolocated. We, um, since the beginning in Italy, we launched the app mainly, even though we have a website uh, version because the app is geolocalized, so you are walking in the street and you can really see which restaurants are around you, which ones are available, what ratings, you can see the menu, you can see the pictures, so there is a lot of information. And restaurants are using this tool a lot, and some of them are aware of, of all the advantages of the importance of, of a nice picture, of the importance of nice reviews, um, of the menu being updated. Others, they, you know, they just don't know. <laughs> but uh, they can see that they rank higher or lower depending on certain things, like rating, like if they are applying or promotion, so they get more bookings. So slowly, slowly, they are improving also the way they advertise, advertise, they operate in the fork. Um, for restaurants, we also help them because we have a management tool that is called the fork manager that they can use to, to seat the people when they arrive, of course, to manage the bookings. There are several versions, more professional or less professional. So for the customers, they can have the best choice. They have the reviews that are always available and, and order by date. And of course, the discounts, and we also have a loyalty program. So the more times you go to the restaurant, the more points you accumulate that you can get discounts later on. And it's very easy to book. So for restaurants, well, they have a lot of visibility. There are restaurants that before the fork were always, always empty, and now <laughs> they are fully booked if they are smart enough to use the software. And also smart enough to use the um, deal management. So for example, I know that most of the people go and, and uh, have uh, dinner at 8 in Italy. But maybe someone could arrive at 7 if I have a promotion. That's shield management. They do it with the planes. Now they are starting to do it with the restaurants. So it means that the amount of seats that I can sell and the amount of people I can serve increases just by using these tools. 
Um, so the software is helping a lot, but also it depends on the seniority, on the smartness of the person that is using the tool. Um, yeah, well, the rest you already know. And yeah, that's it for, for the four. About two years ago, I became obsessed with learning as much as I could about vegetarian food. And I want to tell you the story about that. Um, this is a place where I'm, I'm happiest. Outdoors, hiking in forests, uh, climbing up mountains, it, it relaxes me, it inspires me. I think that's true for many people. And I obviously want these spaces to be preserved and protected. But I also look at the world like this. I love to explore and try food. I find that there's no better way of connecting with people and countries and cultures than by trying their food. And what I have found, I mean, to give an example, I was in a country house of a friend near Rome, and his, his mother offered me the, the porchetta that was from the region. And I would never want to stand there and say, but I'm vegetarian. I, I want to try this, I want to do this, I want to be part of the experience. And so for me, I, I want to eat everything and I want to be proud of that. Now, that's a big conflict because as all of you know, um, our love for food and the openness for wanting this all, is, uh, it, it threatens the environment that we also love. And that's, that's bad. I mean, it's eating less or no meat is the most impactful choice, arguably, that an individual can make for helping to save this environment that I just showed up there. And it was a real big frustration for me. So I was just standing there saying, well, how can I, how can I solve this for me? And what I said I do, and that was like the, the compromise is I said, I just eat 80 or 90% less meat. I'm not going vegetarian. I'm not going vegan. I'm doing that because it's almost as impactful and more importantly, because it's easy. How hard can it be? I can still eat meat on Christmas. I can still eat the porchetta at my friend's house, but most of the time I'll be vegetarian. Well, it's not easy. And show of hands, how many of you have tried to eat less meat? Yeah, lots. Um, and how many of you have still eaten meat actually at this conference in the last four days or three days? The, it's, we're at an innovation and food conference. Every other talk is about uh, plant-based diets. And yet, out in the, in the cafe, there is actually, an, uh, I think, more than 60% of the, of the offering is uh, meat. We, we looked at that. So we were, we were thinking, why is it so hard? Why? I basically became obsessed with answering, why is this so bloody hard? How can that be? And um, that's where More Than Carrots comes in, the business that we founded. Um, it's, we, we're creating solutions for meat reducers. And I think the first thing to do there is, I mean, it's, it's for diners, from diners. We're diners, we're not restaurants. The first thing that I think people have to recognize is that meat reducers are a separate target market. There is 40 to 50% of the population in most of the Western European and North American countries say that they want to eat less meat. But only 5% or so are actually vegetarian. And I, describing meat reducers, I think we, we love food. We, um, we, we will not make no meat our number one priority in life. And we, but we do still like the environment and we are health conscious. And why, why do we need solutions for this group? Because solutions for vegetarians are not good enough for us. And there are plenty of those. There's solutions for vegetarians, there's solutions for vegans, but they're, they're very different. And we are mainly focusing on restaurant food at the moment, where it's particularly um, difficult to, to eat less meat. And I want to give some examples of like, what I mean when I say that the solutions are not good enough for us. There are vegetarian food apps, and there are vegetarian filters within, um, within food apps. But normally, these, uh, these filters uh, restrict us. They, they make us uh, select vegetarian as a first choice. Now, what we need is we need nudges wherever we make food choices. And we've just had some really interesting talks before where we heard that we, we make food choices on platforms when we decide where to travel. We make food choices at the restaurant where stuff can be described in the way as Daniel described um, that, that intrigues us and that, that tempts us, but it can also be described in other ways. And what, what we say is that quite often, once you're at the restaurant, 
it's already almost too late because John Kerry said yesterday the world would be a better place if all of us just made better choices. And quite often choosing the restaurant sets you up for success or failure when it comes to eating vegetarian food. And what, what we say is we want to have this information as meat reducers in the environments that we already visit. We need that information where we already are. And so what we have developed is we've developed a tool that ranks restaurants for the quality of their vegetarian offering. And we can introduce this information and include it in the interface of other food apps, of a food delivery app, of a restaurant booking service like we just saw. Because that's the place where, where we need that information. And we are not the target group that will respond in a survey like this and talk about vegetarian food. We are not going to ask for it because we don't identify as vegetarian. That doesn't mean, though, that we won't use that information if it's there. And the other thing that we need is enjoyable food. Um, we need, like, one thing that I would almost say is that bad vegetarian food may have stopped more people from going vegetarian than anything else. Because if you have bad experiences, you give up. And only great experience will build strong habits, which is really all the what we need to do. Now, it's not surprising that you can fall into that trap. It's very, um, if, you, if you try something new, if you have never done it, like you have to explore, you have to be out there, and you have to do that. But you need to be guided and, and, and helped to become successful. So none of this probably is, is new. Nudging is not a new concept. Um, uh, vegetarian food has been around for a while. We believe, though, that now is the right time because there is amazing vegetarian food out there now. A lot has happened in the last year or two. We would suggest we want to invite people to try again. If you've tried this two years ago and had bad experiences, now that might have changed. And we would also invite people to try more often because giving two or three experiences to vegetarian food is not enough. You have to just explore this. You have to really dive into it and, and, and try and essentially learn about it. But the other reason why now is a good time is that more people care. And not just more diners, but also the head of product at food delivery apps that we've been speaking with care. The buyers at supermarkets care. Daniel has just shown us like 10 companies, big companies, they care. It's, it's everyone wants to do this. They read the same articles that we read. And so we do have a, a long way to go, but it's, it's an exciting market. It's a really exciting um, offering out there now. And brings me to the last slide. What can you do? Like, how can you get involved? Um, try vegetarian food. I mean, our blog is here. Like, subscribe. Tell your friends. Tell people that you think should try. Invite them to try this more often. And then we've just been talking about, uh, about food apps. That's the big project we're working on at the moment. But I also showed before, we, we choose food. We make food choices in so many places. We choose restaurants. We choose destinations to travel. We choose dishes. We choose ingredients. I mean, if you have any other ideas of, of, of areas where you think that we should get involved, we've done in restaurant analysis, we've done branding and design. We want to represent meat reducers. And if you can think of any other environments where our content and, and our, um, our nudging can help, then we'd love to hear from you. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Willem. And um, you're looking at my daughter my youngest daughter, I have three. And let me start with my own food experience. A couple of years ago, I was in Ibiza in a restaurant and I ordered a seaweed salad. I got a beautiful plate, um, but no seaweed to be found. So I felt pretty cheated out of this uh, exotic food that I didn't know anything about at the time. I went to the chef, I complained, um, and he said, no, the, what you thought was the pasta, which you see on the screen, I thought it was green tele tele. He said, that's a very special kind of seaweed, which looks like tagliatella growing on the rocks. And this was a pivoting moment for me. I immediately got fascinated. and I thought, I need to know more about this. I uh, went home. It took me a lot of time to find this particular kind of seaweed. And then I had to start cooking with it to see if it could really replace pasta. Uh, no recipes, nothing there, so uh, I made it, I made bolognese sauce, I tossed it on top, I gave it to my kids, I didn't tell them anything. I watched them eat it, they finished their plates, they survived, they looked healthy, and, and they were just amazed by the way I was looking at them. And they said, Daddy, what's going on? And I said, well, what would you think? 
And yeah, it was fine. It was good. It was a plate of pasta, nice sauce. I said, but it wasn't pasta. It was seaweed. And they looked at me and they said, so what? Uh, and I'll, I'll get back to that, why that's important. Um, so this was my personal food experience. The next video clip will describe why I turned the food experience into a company and what happened in the two and a half years after that. Can you play the, the video? The oceans cover 71% of our planet. But did you know we only get 2% of our food from the ocean? If we keep eating from land like we do today, we're going to need four planets to feed 10 billion people in 2050. So it's clear we need to shift from land to the ocean for our future food. But we also need to shift from animal protein to plant protein for our health and for the planet. And if you connect oceans and plants, what do you get? You get seaweed. And that makes it the ultimate food of the future. Tasty, very healthy, and incredibly sustainable. There is one company that is creating this future as we speak. In September 2015, we started the revolution to turn seaweed into an everyday food. By presenting seaweed as healthy, sustainable alternatives to the foods that we already know and love, like seaweed pasta, seaweed bacon, seaweed wraps. Thousands of people from Amsterdam to Adelaide started cooking and enjoying our products, creating new recipes and proving that seaweed can be an everyday food for many. 69% of our fans never had seaweed before. Since so many people started eating our seaweed, we needed to find enough of it. And together with our partners in Ireland and France, we found a way to harvest large quantities in a sustainable way, which helped to lower the price and make our products much more accessible. To reach the world beyond the early adopters, we started getting the story out by working with bloggers, social media, crowdfunding campaigns, and winning awards We generated free publicity to reach millions of people. In just two years, the Seymour team brought 750,000 servings of seaweed to People's Place via 750 stores in six countries. Now, this was a great start, but we've just gotten started in bringing the future of So that was what happened in the last two and a half years. Um, and it's also an explanation of why I wanted to start the company. Um, we're here to talk about new food experiences. So what I wanted to share is a few of the lessons that we have picked up along the way, because it definitely has not been easy, and it's still not easy to bring seaweed into the market as an everyday food. So my first lesson is that food is not a supplement. For a very small group of people, it might, might be that. And they look at it in a very technical way. But for most people, it is enjoyment. It's a social thing. It's something which brings pleasure to life. So even though nutrients and sustainability of food are incredibly important, food is still something uh, much bigger than that. So what we had to do from the start is to show people that seaweed is actually a food. You can enjoy it, you can make great food with it. It has to look good. The, the packaging has to be uh, uh, tempting. We changed the, the name of the product from seaweed something to uh, something that resembles food that we already know and love. All these things matter, um, as you can see from the different examples. So um, we work with food bloggers, we make videos, cooking videos, all that is related to showing that a new food experience has to look like food that you would love to eat. The second is um, a conflict maybe, but people want innovation but they don't want change. And it's a very interesting concept. So even though we made um, seaweed much more accessible by presenting it as a pasta or a bacon, we found that for some people that was still you know, one bridge too far because it was 100% seaweed. Uh, if you would cook the pasta, you would get some ocean breeze into your kitchen. Um, the bacon still requires you to have the right temperature of oil. So recently, um, we introduced this product, which is a 50% seaweed product. Uh, you don't need to cook it. And there is no edginess anywhere in the product. A and it's our first try to get seaweed onto the plates of an even larger group of people. Uh, and this was based on what I said, people don't want change. They, they can take a little bit of change, but not much. 
they just want everything to become better and healthier and sustainable by magic. And that's one of the most challenging things for a food produ producer to deliver. These are two of the other products that are close to uh, finishing. And they, have, they follow the same philosophy of being very uh, accessible. Third, it's all about the story. Because the problem is that a lot of adults um, have stories already implanted about seaweed. And they're not necessarily positive stories. It's about seaweed getting stuck into their toes when they were young and swimming at, at the coastline. Um, so we need to bring new, fresh, positive stories around seaweed into the world for adults, but also especially for young people. And this is actually true, what you see on a t-shirt. We had this printed and we're wearing it in a lot of fairs. And, um, and there was a BBC article which tried to figure out what was the first organism in the world to actually have sexual reproduction. And of course, you now know which one it is, and it's seaweed. So it, makes it a very sexy food. So this is just one of the stories that we, we bring into the market. Now, this is all, all good and fine, and it shows you three of the lessons that we, that we picked up along the way and that we're working on. I think we're getting better and better at that. But there's also stuff that we haven't figured out yet that we need to turn something into a new food experience. And I called it, if only food could work like tech, and I'm hoping that some of you in, the, in, in, in this room might be able to help out with some of the challenges, because I would love to be able to upgrade our products the same way that you do with apps. And that's incredibly difficult to do in, in food, because you have packaging, it's on the shelf, the retailer doesn't want to change it, even though we would like the speed of innovation for food to be exactly like apps, because then it would go so much faster. So this is one challenge. The other one is instant global distribution. It takes six months for uh, a typical retailer to make one decision about one product. Uh, it slows down everything. It's such a frustrating process. Um, big data, or just data, or just information. We know that there's millions of consumers out there that would match with our products. We have no way of connecting with them. Retailers have information about buying behavior. We don't. Nobody's making the match. And interestingly enough, I see some companies um, add season chips that are moving into that space. So hopefully there's solutions coming up. And lastly, um, there's not a lot of collaborations. You don't see larger companies working together with food startups or retailers working with food startups. It's only starting to begin. So what I want to leave you with is um, what started as a crazy idea became a product, became a company, and is now a movement to turn seaweed into an everyday food. I think we've uncovered some of the, the secrets of, turning, uh, of creating a new food experience, but there's also a, a number of pretty big challenges ahead of us, and I'm hoping that some of you out there will help us uh, with that. And I want to invite you all to visit our stand at D7 and uh, try our products. Thank you so much. Hi everyone, first of all thank you for having us today, it's a great pleasure to be here today. My name is Daphna, I'm uh, the CEO and co-founder of TIPA. And I'm going to talk today about experience, food, new food experience, but from a different angle, from the angle of packaging. So, I'm going to show with you some facts before I start talking about the product itself. So, if we look at the food packaging in general, we have many two categories, rigid, which are bottles, and flexibles, which are all the other, all the other uh, packages that you can see in the supermarket. You can see in this picture some samples. Just think about granola bar, potato chips bag, all the snacks, fresh produce, etc., etc. So the market of flexible is $98 billion, and all this market cannot be recycled. So if we look at bottles, bottles can be recycled. Flexible packaging cannot be recycled. And the real numbers are that only 5% of all that market of flexible packaging is actually recycled today. So the majority actually ends life either in landfills or in the sea, where we don't want to see it, or being incinerated. But that's it. So this is a huge problem that maybe we know about it, maybe we don't know about it, but we have definitely have to, f to, f to figure out how we do it differently. And this is where we come in. So inspiration came from nature. 
Nature also packed. For example, nature packed the, the orange, right? So there's a package to the food. We eat or drink the content of the package, and the package goes to the organic waste stream, right? And decomposes and fully goes back to nature. And that was our inspiration, and this is what we have developed. We have developed a package that is like nature creation, like an orange peel. So the consumer can treat the package as organic material. But it's a package. So it has to have all the properties that we are used to have from conventional plastic. And this is what we did. We developed packages that are fully compostable, 100% compostable. And this way we can treat it as organic material, as organic waste. But it has all the properties that are needed in order to pack food. And this is what we focus on, packing food. This is a sample of a product that's installed in the UK. It's, a, it's kind of a complex package. It packs uh, um, snack, snacks. You can see the package, how it looks in the beginning. It f looks and feels like conventional plastic, and that's what happens in 24 weeks. In six months in compost conditions, the package breaks down, disintegrates. It's been eaten by bacteria, and there you have compost, and there you have circular economy. So we take a package that is like plastic, we put it in compost, it becomes a fertilizer, which is a resource. And that's, that's our solution. That's only one sample. Let's see what happens in the market. So we've been in the market, we've been working on this uh, solution in the last, I would say, six years. Coming out with our vision, our mission, and suddenly we, we see changes, major changes, tectonic changes in the markets going towards this, uh, this uh, solution. So first of all, there's a demand coming from the clients, from the supermarkets, from the consumers, to have plastic, free plastic, free plastic aisle, free plastic products, having products that we can treat not as plastic. That's one thing. The other thing are big companies, big companies that actually coming out with announcements that by 2025, and some of them by 2020, all the products will be either recyclable, reusable, or compostable. And when they say compostable, they know what they say. They mean all the products that cannot be either recycled or reusable, and there's a lot. So this is the second thing, the brands um, demand and need, and of course the government. So in the beginning, in middle 2017, China announced that they're not going to accept any more plastic waste coming from the West. That actually was, uh, um, they started to do that in the beginning of 2018, and that actually puts many territories in, b in very big difficulties, because no more shipping of plastic waste to China. And that's where the revolution starts to happen. So um, it already happened in France. We see regulation towards compostables, EU, of course, and the UK. Theresa May, actually, I think it's the next slide. No. So Theresa May actually came out with an announcement that she's going to start fighting um, plastic, plastic packaging. And that was actually, that's actually what happened, has been happening in the market in the UK in the last few months. OK, so what do we offer in TIPA? So you know the idea, you know the solution, you know what we aim to offer. What I'm going to show now is the portfolio of the products that are already on the shelves, mainly in Europe, also in the US. And now we have new clients coming from other territories around the world. So this is our first generation of products, OK? This is an apple, of course, fresh produce uh, um, package. Snacks you saw earlier. This is for snacks. Grains, coffee, coffee beans, different kind of packaging, sachets, this is a powder, trays with lids, all of them compostable, fully compostable. Of course, tea, standard pouches, granola bars, and some non-food applications like apparel and magazines, and of course, zipper bags. So all those products that I showed today are already in the market. And this is our first generation of products. Of course, we get a lot of coverage and a lot of conferences like here and a lot of coverage because we are the right solution in the right time in the right place. And I just covered what happens in the market. So this is, this is just a slide of show off, OK, to see uh, the attention that we get. And for me, this is the last slide. And this is the most important one. 
because this is the vision and the mission that we carry in TIPA. So the vision is that consumers will treat packaging no more as plastic, but as organic material. And it will be part of our kitchen waste, part of our organic waste. And if we look at the vision, not in many years' time, but we can really change the world if we all adopt that kind of solutions and leave a better world to our children. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. I am uh, Graziella Chini from Florence, and uh, I, I, am, I am a researcher in Florence, and uh, I, uh, working, I work with microalgae for uh, several years. Uh, so considering uh, that uh, the global population um, increase very fast and uh, reach up to 10 billion of uh, people in the 2015, the global food production will have to increase up to 70% in the next 30 years. So, uh, increasing, uh, um, increasing production of uh, food, of course, uh, increase also uh, water demand and uh, uh, fossil uh, energy uh, demand. And uh, this is, is a very um, problem because uh, you have a problem in the climate change. So, uh, planet resources are consumed at a faster rate than their generation. So we need to, um, uh, to uh, have some solution for this. Uh, for example, to produce with less resources, to reduce waste, and also to, um, to develop innovative, innovative food um, source. Among this, we have uh, algae. Uh, microalgae and uh, microalgae. This is microalgae that the colleague have uh, spoke about this uh, before, and uh, um, this is my mi microalgae. This is a phototrophic uh, microorganism, and exists a, a, very, a lot of uh, species in the world. And uh, um, compared to the, to the vegetable, to the crop, uh, have a good productivity, can be produced in marginal land, and can grow on salt water, don't require herbicide or pesticide. Uh, this, is, uh, uh, this point are very important concerning uh, sustainability and are able to synthesize high value products. Among the products, um, uh, proteins are one of the most important. So microalgae can um, represent an alternative protein source and an innovative protein source. Considering that protein consumption increases very, very fast, is mandatory to uh, develop new alternative protein source. Among these, microalgae and insect. So uh, what microalgae can uh, uh, consider, uh, can, uh, consider the very promising as a protein source? So there is uh, some, uh, uh, some species uh, that is uh, spirulina and uh, chlorella that uh, is uh, uh, considered very um, good source because the content of protein is very, very high, but uh, in general, all the microalgae contain, contain high amount of protein um, content that is very, uh, very high and higher uh, compared to soybean. Another uh, is important also to note that the protein of microalgae is very, very uh, of good quality um, materials is compared to the traditional food. So, um, 
an example I can show here one example for demonstra to demonstrate that uh, microalgae uh, can uh, produce a very high amount of uh, protein. In this table, we can see the difference in production for, uh, for year and for hectare between uh, spirulina, that is a microalgae, and uh, um, soya, for example. This is 10 um, times higher production uh, annually. So, but the microalgae are not only a uh, source of protein, can produce a very um, high value product such as pigment that is very interesting uh, in food industry, cosmetic, pharmaceutical, aquaculture, because they have antioxidant, anti-inflammatory and anti-cancer uh, activities. So these uh, products are very important for addition in food. Oh, also polyunsaturated fatty acid are very important in the microalgae, mainly in the marine microalgae. Marine microalgae are the first um, producer of polyunsaturated fatty acid that can transfer it in the fish. So it's very, very important to consider the, the microalgae as a uh, source of omega-3 long chain polyunsaturated fatty acid. So, um, we can consider that uh, for this reason, we can consider that uh, microalgae can, uh, can be used as uh, uh, food product or as ingredient to enhance the nutritional value of, the co of conventional food. Uh, among the microalgae that uh, are this characteristic and the best candidate is spirulina. Spirulina is uh, a very old microorganism that uh, um, is uh, um, uh, is origin in the in the in the earth uh, about 3.5 billion years ago and uh, is used for centuries mainly in Mexico, Central America and Africa. Atseki used spirulina naturally harvested in the Mexico and uh, also in the African, in the, in the Lago Chad, the bloom of spirulina are harvested and processed and used as food. So, uh, is a very, uh, spirulina is a very old, uh, is a new food, is a novel food, but is in reality is a very old. And uh, today is uh, produced uh, in, the, uh, in the world and the production is about 10,000 ton per hectare per, uh, per year. And is considered the best food for future, also for the World uh, Health Organization. So why spirulina is a good, uh, is a very uh, super food? <laughs> because they have a very high amount of protein, about, uh, and the average is 70, 70%, but not only protein, have also other nutrients. So for example, two examples, two examples, uh, beta carotens, beta carotens is two times higher than the carrot and also iron, that is 10 higher, uh, 10 times higher than the, uh, spinach. So the benefit of the spirulina that I have demonstra demonstrated for a long time are these. Immuno uh, one of the most important is to inc the, the, increase, the increase of um, im immunitary system. So this is the benefit of the spirulina. And this is when we had the spirulina in the traditional food, for example, in paste or in the, in the bread, in the cheese, or the, in, the, in, the other, in the other traditional food, we can to transfer this benefit in the traditional system, in the traditional uh, food. So, uh, spirulina is uh, widely used in uh, Africa and also in part of Asia, but uh, is not uh, very familiar in the European, in the Europa. 
Europe because, because of limited uh, um, knowledge about this and uh, also because it is not very easy to, uh, to see in the supermarket and also uh, for the um, regulation uh, for the, on the market that is very, very difficult to, uh, to have approbation by uh, European community. So uh, it's important also uh, this point that for the development of new product is required active participation of consumers because the product need to, um, uh, to have the approbation of consumers. So it's important to develop a new product containing, incorporating containing microalgae uh, uh, on the base of the sensory data. So two examples that uh, we have here, this is uh, paste with the addition of spirulina uh, powder and uh, at the two concentration, 5% and 10%. This is the uh, sensory uh, analysis and we can see uh, that the overall quality of the, pa the, the paste is uh, decreased, increasing the amount of spirulina more than 5%. So here we can see another important uh, the quality. The quality of the paste with addition of spirulina is higher. You can see here that uh, the, we have a very amount of uh, amount increase of protein and uh, also um, lower glycemic index that is very important for uh, uh, diabetes. Another example about the cookies that were enriched with two different microalgae and two different amount. We can see here the different amount. So it's very important to note that the best, the more appreciated cookie, cookies is that containing spirulina, that is scientific name, Arthrospira platensis, uh, at the 2%. So thank you for uh, uh, attention and uh, uh, I hope that uh, in the near future uh, spirulina product uh, come on the market, on the supermarket. <laughs>